Well, we are kicking into Core Christmas, and we're starting a brand new series. We like to celebrate Christmas all during the month of December. It's a big deal. In fact, we're in the um, Advent season. We have an Advent daily devotional we're going through. If you don't get the email updates, I encourage you to sign up for those at corechurch.com. Because Advent is just simply this preparation. It's this... Uh, this anticipation of the coming of Christmas. It's not enough just that we wait the week before, but we want every week for us to prepare. In the midst of all that is happening, it is time for us to celebrate because hope has come, joy has come, love has come, peace has come, all of those things that are all wrapped up in Advent that we are going to be talking about. But our series that we're doing during Core Christmas is called Christmas in the Neighborhood. Christmas in the neighborhood. So what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks is the neighborhood, the place where you live, the street that you live on. And when you think about your neighborhood, I want you to think beyond even just the place where you you live. It might be your workplace. It might be the campus that you're on. It might be the the ball team that your kids play on or that you play on. Or maybe the the neighborhood stores that that you frequent. You see those cashiers and those different employees over and over again. These are our neighbors. And so today... I, I want to. I'm actually going to talk a lot about the neighborhood, the, the the street that you live on. But as I talk about that, I want you to just kind of get your mind thinking of all these other places as well. So if you have a Bible, let's go to John's Gospel, John chapter one. Now John doesn't really tell the Christmas story, and if he does, he kind of tells it in a different way. If you don't know who John is, maybe you're new to the Scriptures. John was a disciple of Jesus. And he simply wrote the story of Jesus' life on this earth. And he doesn't start with a Christmas story like Luke and Matthew do. Uh, He actually kind of jumps right into the middle of it. And he uses an interesting um, word, which is the word, for the name of Jesus. And if you have a Bible, John chapter 1, I read out of the New Living Translation. If you don't have a Bible, I just encourage you to download YouVersion. It's a great app. Uh, And let's go to John 1 and verse 14. That's where I want to start, and this is where we're going to focus today. John says this, so the Word, and the Word here is capitalized. That's because he's talking about Jesus. The Word became human and made his home among us. We're going to talk about that. We're going to actually look at the message translation where Eugene Peterson says he moved into the neighborhood kind of the theme and and where we get the title for our series today. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him. Now, not John, this is confusing. This gets so confusing. John's writing about John, different John, talking about John the Baptist. I wish he'd said that here. John the Baptist testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, this is the one I was talking about when I said, someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. From his abundance, we have all received one glorious blessing after another. Come on, wherever you are, turn to somebody and tell them, you are blessed because of God. You are blessed because of God. For the law was given through this guy named Moses, but God's unfailing love and his faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. In other words, if you want to know who God is, what God looks like, how God talks, the things that God does, just look at the life of Jesus and you will see God. Today, the title of my message is Move on Mission. Move on mission. Let's pray. God, in the moments that we have together, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would give us a passion, a passion for you. Would you, would you give us, God, uh, affect our minds today, that we would learn today, God? Would you, would you penetrate our souls? Would you, would you change us intimately? In Jesus' name we pray, and wherever you are, say amen. Well, I, I think uh, nobody enjoys moving. I mean, you, you, you enjoy moving because you, you're going to be moving to a new house or a new place, a new experience, but nobody likes packing up and having to haul things. And recently, Aunt Mary, a lot of you know Aunt Mary. I talk about her all the time. She's become legendary around our church. She's actually watching online today. Hey, Aunt Mary. Um, but she recently moved from a small town in Missouri, Monette, Missouri, here to Broken Arrow to uh, live with us. And uh, when she moved, uh, I, I, and I say she moved, uh, I, I moved her. So I, I was kind of in charge of the move. And, and I was thinking, you know what? The la- 
I, I love Aunt Mary more than I, I love almost anyone else. And even you know how when a friend calls you and they and they and they use that word we're moving and you're like ah oh, it's just the one thing you don't want to no matter how much you love somebody and so I thought you know what how about we get somebody to help and so I, honestly I called up the I don't know it was two guys in a truck whatever that's called and and then when when they gave me the quote I was like well how many guys and how many trucks are coming good night how much is this and I said okay never mind going old school. We're going to, we're going to go the U-Haul way. I love U-Haul because they're very subtle in their advertising. They lose, use the letter U, but really what they're saying is you, Y-O-U, you going to be loading those boxes. You going to be unloading and loading up that truck. That's going to be you. So I, uh, go to this, um, to Monette, Missouri in this, in this small town, I go to pick up the U-Haul. It's kind of at this good old boy shop and just envision it small town, USA, and just a, a grease monkey place and a, not even a paved uh, uh, parking lot. It's all gravel with grass and weeds growing up in it. I mean, just you got the picture in your head. That's where this was. And I walk up the steps and I walk inside the place and I was like, whoa, oh, man, if the pandemic doesn't get me, this place will. <laughs> and that's like, oh, my goodness. And then the guy, the guy was super nice. I mean, just, you know, the, you know, those guys in, in small town, super nice guy. Behind the counter, he goes, all right, man, I need you to sign right here. And he hands me over his pen where it's been nubbed off and chewed on, gnawed on by like a guard dog or, or, or I don't know, maybe him or his sister. I'm not sure. And, <laughs> sorry, that was me. And, and so I go to grab the pen, and I'm like, ah. Oh. And I just kind of <laughs> sign it, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. So we walk out. We walk out of the shop together. And uh, he walks me over to the U-Haul, tosses me the keys, and he's like, good luck. <laughs> And the way he said good luck was very sarcastic in nature. I could tell he was like, good luck, city boy. Like, he thought I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, yeah, whatever. So I got up in that truck, you know, and sat down. And there's this um, just kind of this unassumed, uh, unspoken assumption that every guy knows how to drive a truck. But here's the truth. Most guys, when we get in the truck, we start sweating. We get a little nervous. And this guy's standing up on the steps. He's watching me. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm, I'm sweating. I'm like, I feel like I'm 16 again going to my driver's test. And I'm like, 10 and 2, Brad. 10 and 2. 10 and 2. <laughs> so anyway, I go to pull out of the lot. And all I'm thinking to myself is navigate the turn right. Don't put it in the ditch. And don't back it up. If you have to back it up, this guy's going to be mocking you with everyone he knows. And so, But I, I navigated the turn. Got out fine. We got Aunt Mary here. She's in town. Everybody's safe. Everything's good. But when... When we think about moving and we get over the experience of having to literally move, the one thing that we all do is there's some key factors we look for when we move. Like you're looking specifically at the square footage of the house. You're looking at uh, the layout of the house. You're looking at the yard. What kind of yard does it have? What kind of, how do my neighbors take care of their yard? What is that like? How, uh, what are the, if you're a parent, what are the schools like? How far is it to work? And more importantly, the most important thing is how far is Walmart? But today I want to I talk about a key factor that I think most people never think about and they completely miss when it comes to moving. This factor is more important than square footage. It's more important than a layout. It's more important than the schools or how far work is. In fact, as a follower of Jesus, I would tell you this is the key factor that Jesus wants you to consider before you make any kind of move. And what's interesting is the last place I think we would think to find moving instructions is in the scriptures, but but there they are in the scriptures. Go back to the gospel of John, John 1.14. And here's what the message translation says. Eugene Peterson wrote it this way. He said the word, again, that's Jesus. The word became flesh and blood. And say it with me, what? Moved into the neighborhood. I think it's very interesting that Jesus moves in the neighborhood and not into the temple. Because if you think about it, if God is going to be moving in, where's the one place you're going to look for him? You're going to go look for him in the temple. But Jesus, when it came to his ministry, he didn't spend most of his time in the temple. He spent most of his time in neighborhoods, in, in homes, going across the street, spending time with people. Now, there, there's a difference, big difference between moving into a house and moving into the neighborhood like Jesus did. Like when you, when you move into a house, 
Uh, I mean, you you move into a house. It, that's the place where you eat. It's the place where you sleep. It's where you watch Netflix. Get caught up in, on Selena. You know, you're, you're just doing. You're, you're hanging out with your family. Um, it's very inward focused. Not bad. It's just it's just about you and your family. But when you move into a neighborhood, that's very outward focused. I think of it like this. Think of it like a cruise ship experience. If you've ever been on a cruise, but when you book a cruise, you don't book it for the room. That's, you could care less about the room because you're not going to be spending any time in the room. Laura and I went on a cruise several years ago, and I, I didn't care what room we were in. I want to know what was happening on the cruise because I'm going to spend most of my time outside. In fact, and you do the craziest things on cruises. You're eating at midnight. You're going to the weirdest shows. Laura and I ended up in a karaoke contest. A karaoke. We were doing, Laura and I were doing karaoke. I'd never forget. We did Love Shack. Remember Love Shack? Love Shack, baby, Love Shack. It I thought I was going to be amazing at it, and wow, I mean, even the whales were struggling. It was like, and that was just Laura and I, not the whales. I mean, it was just, it was bad. But so when you, when you think about it, Jesus calls us to move into the neighborhood. We're not just supposed to move into a house. But like Jesus, we're supposed to move into the neighborhood. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting by any means that you should have a karaoke night, but do you know your neighbors? Do you, do you know who you're, do you know them beyond, uh, you know, the people that crank Leonard Skinner till 1 a.m. in the morning? Not that I have neighbors like that. Not that I know anyone <laughs> like that. I mean, do you know the person at work beyond, she's always late? Do you, do you know the parent on the ball team other than the one who complains about their kids playing time is always yelling at the refs. So do you do you know your neighbors? Because Jesus, Jesus moved in on mission. He was very intentional about going across the street, going next door, sitting around tables, getting to know people. In fact, there's a story in Luke about Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, if you don't know that story, is basically Zacchaeus, think of the neighbor you don't like and you wish they would move. That was Zacchaeus. Nobody liked Zacchaeus, but Jesus went and ate around Zacchaeus' table. At the end of that story, Jesus said this in Luke 19, 10. He said, for the Son of Man came to, say this with me, seek and save. Seek and save those who are lost. This is the main factor we should consider when moving. This is the main factor we should consider when you take a new job. This, I believe, is even the main factor when you think about the ball team your kids are playing on. This is the mindset. This is the way we should be thinking because Jesus says this is our mission. His mission is our mission. He's calling, he didn't just come to seek and save those who are lost. He calls us to do the same. It's something we say all the time. We are here to take the hope and the healing and the peace and the purpose of Jesus into our world. I'd like for you to write this down. It's something I've been saying throughout 2020. We are all missionaries. We are all missionaries. Turn to somebody wherever you are and say, you, my friend, are a missionary. We are all missionaries. Write this down. On mission. Jesus' mission is our mission, and we are assigned, write this down, assigned to a mission field. Like, when you think about it, your, your neighborhood, that's your mission field. When you get up tomorrow, you go to work, guess what, follower of Jesus? That's your mission field. When you're on that campus, when you're in that particular classroom, you've been assigned that classroom by God. Not, not because you filled out a form, not because you like that professor or that teacher. No, you're actually in that class on purpose, sitting next to somebody on purpose for a purpose. That ball team that you go to practices during the week, that maybe this weekend you've been out on ball fields, guess what? You were on mission. You were actually not on a soccer field. You were not on a basketball court. You were on a mission field. This is our assignment. Now, here's what happens. The reason so often we don't think that way is we get kind of stuck. The church gets stuck in an Old Testament model. Now, the Old Testament model was that God's presence was in the temple. And if you wanted to see God or be with God, you went 
to the temple to experience God. It was kind of a come and see model. The, the religious leaders come to the temple, come to the temple, come to the temple, offer the sacrifice, come to the temple for forgiveness, come to the temple, and that's where the presence of God is. Well, Jesus shows up, and Jesus shows us a new way. He introduces a new model, a new way, and that that is through the cross. As Jesus says, no, no, the new way is that we are going to leave the temple. Jesus actually, through his death, the curtain in the Holy of Holies torn in two, and the presence of God went out through his people. You read in the book of Acts, it went out through his people. We talked about a couple of weeks ago that the apostle Paul said that we are, we are now temples of the Holy Spirit. This just messed with their minds. They're, no, the temple's that big building. That's, that's where God is. And they said, no, 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 you are. Same thing's true for us. Like the church, no, that's where God is, that building where we meet, 5205. No, 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 no. No, you and I are the temple. A couple weeks ago, I talked about how we're many temples. I believe that we are many temples spread out all over the city. Right now, wherever you are, you are a mini temple. Like you're a mini temple of God in your neighborhood. Your home is like a temple in your neighborhood. You're, you're, we're at your workplace, you are a mini temple to give the light of Christ to people. On your campus, on that ball field, you are a mini temple temple. And when you moved into the neighborhood, guess what? Jesus moved in with you. So the question I want to ask is this. When your neighbors, when your neighbors are struggling, when they're hurting, when they've had a setback or a crisis, do they know they can knock on your door? That's a question I think Jesus wants us all to ponder today. I want you to get a picture of something for just a moment. I I want you to think for just a moment about somebody in your neighborhood that doesn't know Jesus. Neighbor left, right, uh, across the street. Maybe it's a coworker, somebody you know, a coworker, or maybe it's somebody on your kid's ball club, ball field, or uh, maybe it's uh, it's somebody um, on your campus, somebody you sit next to. Got a picture of that person? You're like, I'm not sure if they do or not. Hold on to that picture. You may know, they may or may not know Jesus, but you're not sure. I want you to imagine this, that that you start praying for them, and you start thinking about them, and you start looking for opportunities to, to be Jesus to that person. And I, I want you to vision as you're praying every day for that person, that that person goes through a crisis, and suddenly the knock comes on your door. And they say, hey, you got a second? I should imagine you're standing there, and you start talking to them, they're pouring out their heart to you. And the next thing you know, you're, you're, you're pouring out your heart to them, and you're starting to tell them about the hope of Jesus, and they're, they're, they're listening for the first time. And I'm not talking about days. I'm talking about weeks. I'm not talking about months. I'm talking about sometimes years of this. Maybe may two, three years later, somebody's coming to you. And I want you to imagine you begin having conversations, and time goes by, and next thing you know, they, they start coming to church with you. They start sitting with you in church. And then the next thing you know, you're not sitting in the seats anymore. They're not sitting in the seats, but you're actually up on the platform and you're actually standing in that baptismal pool because they're getting baptized and you, you are the one who's baptizing them. I want you to imagine that. It it is possible. I want you to turn to somebody and say, it is possible. God wants to use you. And I know when I tell that kind of story and think that way, you go, man, that's great, but not me, Brad. I mean, I'm just sweating thinking about it. That's way above my pay grade. And here's what I'm just so frustrated about. We have made sharing Christ so difficult, so hard, that even preachers can't do it. And I, it's like you got to memorize all four Gospels. you got to get them in the right order. you got to get the presentation in the right order. You bet If you're going to pray with somebody to receive Jesus, you better get the prayer right because if you mess that up, they could end up in hell. And then Jesus is looking at you on Judgment Day and going, well, thanks a lot, Bob. I mean, suddenly it's your, your fault. And then you're like, how do I work Jesus into an awkward conversation? You know, I mean, it's like, uh, uh, hey, did you, uh, did you hear they got a vaccine? Uh, you, you know what else there's a vaccine for? Your soul. I mean, it's just, no, none of us want to do that. I think we've made it way too difficult, but I believe everyone can share Christ. Everyone can share Christ. Come on, to wherever you are, turn to somebody, encourage them, and tell them right now, you can share Christ. You can share Christ. I want to give you three, three easy ways 
that you can do that. So I'd like for you to write these down. So whatever you got to do on your phone or with a pen or paper, write that down. Uh, and I want you to think about these. I found in John 1, 14, I think uh, the apostle John kind of hints at them a little bit here, where he says this, he being Jesus was full of, say this with me, unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have, say this with me, seen his glory. The glory of the Father's one and only Son. Now, if you've been a part of Core Church for any amount of time, you're gonna know these three things that I talk about. But I'm gonna come back to them because I think they're so easy and they're so practical and it's something that God's calling us to do right now. Here's the first one I want you to write down is the word intercede. Intercede, pray for your neighbor. Intercede, pray for your neighbor. Because here's what happens. When you start praying for your neighbors, God fills you full of unfailing love for your neighbors. Like, like right now, we, as we said earlier, uh, when we started this morning, we're praying for hundreds of people. You've turned in hundreds of names of neighbors and coworkers and friends and, and, and family members that don't know Jesus. And if you've not had a chance to do that yet, I want to encourage you to go to corechurch.com or excuse me, go to Core Christmas corechristmas.com, scroll to the bottom, send in the names. We're praying every day over every name that came in all during this Christmas season. We wanna join with you. We wanna pray with you. So I want you to think for just a moment about that person you were envisioning earlier, that coworker, that neighbor, that person on the ball team or the campus. Did you get the picture of that person? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to share with somebody wherever you're gathered. I want you to turn to somebody wherever you're gathered. I want you to share about that person, okay? I'll give you just a moment, just do that right now. Now, I realize when we did that, for some of you, it might have been a little bit awkward because you're like, I don't really know anyone that doesn't know Jesus. But that's why I want to encourage you to start with prayer. Because here's what prayer says to God. I'm available, now make me aware. I'm available, now make me aware. So intercede, pray for your neighbor. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. Invest, invest, do good to your neighbor. Invest, do good to your neighbor. Like Jesus, be faithful. Like just be there when your neighbor needs you. Just do good. That might be just simply saying hi to your neighbor or your coworker or the person uh, on your camp. Just acknowledging the cashier, just acknowledging that buying toilet paper for people. I mean, you want to you want to do good right now? Give somebody a roll of toilet paper in the name of Jesus. It will be powerful. I mean, that's one thing we all need. It's just so practical and doing good. When you begin to pray, you begin to do things intentionally in the name of Jesus. You don't even have to mention the name of Jesus. Like yesterday, I was out working in the yard and my neighbor was putting up a fence and had a couple of guys coming to help put up the fence. And they were, they were trying to dig out uh, the ground and good old Oklahoma clay, snap, heard the, heard the shovel go snap. And I look over, the guy's got little part of the handle of the, of the shovel and he's just basically trying to dig out. It was just, just the small little part of the shovel. And I said, hey man, do you need a shovel? And he's like, yeah. So I went to my shed, I grabbed a couple sh uh, shovels and grabbed a pickaxe and handed it to him. Now, when I say that, you're like, Brad, how is that sharing Christ? Seriously? How is it? When you are intentional, here's the thing. You never know what that person is going through, and you never know the conversations that they're having with God and how he's using that in their life. So invest. Do good to your neighbor. The third one is this. Inform. Inform. Talk uh, uh, Talk about Jesus with your neighbor. Inform. Talk about Jesus with your neighbor. John said this, we have seen his glory. Listen, we need to get to a place where we start showing people who Jesus is. Like when the Holy Spirit prompts you, when you feel that prompting on you to share Christ, you need to share Jesus. Now that might mean praying with somebody. And you're like, this is gonna be awkward. Yeah, be, I always say this, be awkward, don't be weird. It's always awkward, but it's like, 
can I pray for you? Just, just be obedient to that. Maybe, maybe it's sharing a scripture. There's a scripture that meant a lot to you, and you can hand that scripture to someone else. Or, uh, or, or maybe, it's, maybe it's sharing your story. Maybe it's what God did for you that you can share with someone else. So I, I pray our sending prayer every day. You, you know that about me, and uh, we're going to pray it at the end of our service today. But I pray it every day because I basically would say to God, I'm available, now make me aware. But I don't always get it right. Wish I did, but I don't always get it right. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, Laura lives for Christmas. She loves Christmas. So I decided I was going to go to our neighborhood dollar store, and I was going to buy her a Christmas starter kit. Like I put a subscription to the Hallmark Channel in it and uh, tip to guys, guys, single, married, dollar store, your best friend. Cheap gifts, very impressive. Okay, so I go there, I start buying all these little different Christmas uh, knickknack things for her and, and I go up to pay for it at the register and, and as uh, the young lady there rings up the, the sale, I suddenly realize all I have on me is a $100 bill. I'm like, ah, at the dollar store. I'm like, this is not going to be good. Uh, and, and and some of you remember uh, the story I told a few weeks ago, and this is kind of important to the story. Um, I was about three hundred dollars short on my for a truck repair. I needed a truck repair, and I was three hundred dollars short. And by the grace of God and a miracle of God, someone who didn't even know I needed three hundred dollars gave me three hundred dollars, blessed me with three one hundred dollar bills. Thus, that was what was in my wallet. And she said, yeah, you, you could pay cash, and that's all I had. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll pay for it. And so I, I paid for it. She gave me, the, gave me the change, and she said, man, what are you doing with a $100 bill? I don't see those very often. And I just, that was my moment. I felt prompted by God. And I said, well, it's kind of a weird story. And I told her what I just told you. And as I walked out of the store, I just looked at her, and I said, you know, I, I think God wants to answer your prayer too. Maybe just pray and ask him, and I, I believe he's going to answer that for you. Turned, walked out of the store, and I was just really, I was like, man, I was really glad I'd listened to the voice of God. Except what happened next? So I heard God speak to me and prompt me, and he said, hey, go back and give her the change. <laughs> Wait, what? And I walked out of the store, and God said, go back and give her the change. Now, I got to tell you, to be honest, I thought, I started um, kind of talking to myself and I kind of talked myself out of it because I was like, no, somebody gave me that money. That's for my truck. And obviously that's me. That's not God. Obviously that's not, that's not God. God wouldn't tell me to do that. He gave me that and I'm supposed to use that for me. And God just said, this is what you're supposed to do. And I got in my truck and I drove away. And I didn't do what God told me to do. And it just kept gnawing at me. And in fact, the next day I was here at the church where we are right now at the, uh, on our land, and I was prayer walking on the land, and I was out prayer walking. And in the middle of my prayer, God said, hey, you were supposed to give that young lady that your change. And I'm like, I know, God, I, I'm really sorry. I, re I blew that one. And he said, go back. I'm like, go back? He's like, go back. I'm like, I'm, go back. She's probably not even going to be there. And I, I, I don't even remember who she was. And God says, go back. And I'm like, okay, I'll go back. So that night I, I get in my truck that needs the repair. And I drive back to the, the dollar store. And as I pull into the dollar store, I am not making this up. There is one parking space and it's right in front of the front doors, not making that up. And so I was like, obviously God is not in this. Obviously God doesn't want me to do this. So I, I pull into that parking space and I start looking into the store to see if I can see the young lady. I can't really remember who she was. And then I see this cashier and I'm like, I think that was her. I'm pretty sure that was her. And so I walk into the store and uh, and I must have looked like I was casing the joint because I had my mask on and I was kind of just fumbling around, not really shopping, kind of looking around. I was like, this does not look good. But she had people that, um, that she was uh, checking out. And, and so once her line cleared, I went over and, and I said, um, hey, um, I was here uh, a few days ago and, uh, and 
I said, uh, do you remember me? I, I was the one with the $100 bill. Do you remember me? And she, I'm not kidding, looked at me like, uh, and she had this look on her face like, oh, great. I bet I gave you the wrong change, and you're going to get on to me, and I'm going to get fired. She just had that look on her face. And I said, no, 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 this is actually good. I said, um, I said this is going to sound weird, but um, I was supposed to give you the change. And so I, I opened up my wallet, and I pulled out the money, and I handed it to her. And she just, she just had this look like, I don't even know what to do with this. And, and I said, it's okay that I give it to you, right? And she said, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, I just want you to know God, God told me to do it. She's like, thank you, thank you. And I was like, no, 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 this is, thank God he's watching out for you. And I'm, I didn't listen, and now I am, and this is him doing this for you. And I turned to walk out of the store, and all of a sudden I heard somebody say, hey, hey, sir, sir, wait. And I turned and looked, and I didn't know this, but her manager and another employee were watching the whole thing. And her manager yells out, and she says, no, thank you. No, you have no idea what this means. You have no idea. Thank you. And I just said, hey, don't thank me. Listen, this is about God. I'm just trying to do what God told me to do. You guys have a great day. And I turned, and I went, and I got in my truck. And when I sat in my truck, and I looked back into the store, the three of them had gathered together, and that young lady was just weeping. And I'm telling you, that was better than any gift I could have ever received. When Jesus says it's more, you're more blessed to give than to receive, <laughs> I was like, can I give away the rest of this? I mean, I drove home, but I don't think my truck tires were on the ground. It was unbelievable the way in which God, I had been obedient to God. God wants to use you in the same way. I wanna challenge you. What if every day throughout the month of December, what if you prayed the sending prayer? What if you prayed that and you said, God, basically said this, God, I'm available, now make me aware. Maybe that's the only prayer you pray. God, I'm available, now make me aware. And then just look for opportunities. Look for opportunities to do good. And when the time's right, what if you shared Christ? I believe that God wants to use you. Like, He's calling all of us to live as missionaries on mission, assigned to a mission field.